Did you know that in French, hi-hats are called charlies because of the Charleston, because of jazz music? Charlies. So even when you're making techno, you're putting like little charlies on the 16th notes. I don't think I've ever gotten over that. Over the years, I would say I've been getting blocked several times again and again and again with regards to hi-hat programming, hi-hat sound design, and just generally hating the high ends that I make. And so I know that videos about bass get a lot of clicks, but let's talk about high end. And let me invite you in into my encyclopedia of things that work when programming hi-hats. This is an educational video. You're about to get educated. Get your education pants on, get your education helmet on, put your education boots on, put on your lab coat, put on your little space boots, put on your space suits, open up your chakras and focus on your third eye because we are going to the high frequencies. Let's get going. Name one genre of music that doesn't use hi-hats. You can't. I knew it. The hi-hat is ubiquitous. That just means it's everywhere. It's everywhere all the time. It is the natural upbeat to the downbeat. So if the kick drum is the downbeat, the hi-hat is the natural upbeat. It is the yang to the ying of all music production. So what you want is that the high end of your track is a group that is deep and dynamic, that feels alive, that has micro movements in it, that has different energy levels, and that sounds awesome solo. And it has to not only sound awesome solo, but it also has to be dependable and reliable enough that it doesn't become the lead element of your track. It is the upper infrastructure of your track, this energy layers that are supposed to sit up there, but that are not going to draw your ear away from whatever's going on in the mids that's supposed to be the focus of your track. If you're like me and you're often impatient while making a composition, what you might do is just drop a single note that triggers a single 909 hi-hat sample, and it sounds like this. And while that may be the absolute lowest common denominator of a hi-hat, the level one entry basic way of doing it, it really doesn't give the ear a lot to work with. So we're gonna break down hi-hat design into four levels. First it's the programming, which means like where are the MIDI notes and what are they doing. Then we're gonna sound design a single hi-hat in excruciating detail. You're gonna reach a point where it's like, yeah, Oscar, I think I get it. And then we're not even gonna be halfway yet. Okay, so get ready. If you have to go to the bathroom, now is the time because I'm not stopping halfway through. Then we're gonna talk about how hi-hats work as a group together, as different energy levels and how they complement each other. And then level four is where we're gonna start to have a little bit too much fun and just do some silly stuff because it's exciting. And the main tool that we're going to be using is a sampler, whatever sampler works in your doll. Mine's going to be Ableton Live. Okay, wear headphones because there's going to be very small nuances. This is going to be serious business. Let's get into it. Level one, the programming. Okay, we're going to start with an undesigned hi-hat. Simply a little splash of white noise going through a bandpass filter over here. Nothing fancy, right? Because what we want to do now is we want to look at what happens on the grid. When we create a new MIDI clip, you see you've got 16 16th notes. That's kind of our playground. That's what we're going to be working with. And specifically for hi-hats, we might want to work with drastically less even. Maybe we want to set our loop to only be a quarter note, so one beat. Because in there, we can break it down into just four 16th notes and think about all the different grooves that that gives us, all the different rhythmic cells that that gives us to build off of. So for example, simple, right? By the way, let me add this little kick and clap as a placeholder so that we have a metronome. Okay, so every 16th note is playing right now. At this level, we have to think about velocity. So we might want to, for example, pull down some of the velocities on things. We might want to mute certain steps and we might want to push every second note back a little bit to create something called swing. These are the ways in which we can humanize our MIDI. So for example, this is a very different vibe than what it was. Here we go. Now we've got some kind of shuffly feeling going on. Nice. Immediately the programming is making it feel more alive. Do you remember my video on syncopation? Within this little block, we have three different types of beats. We have the downbeat, which is where the kick drum hits. Then we have the upbeat, which is halfway between. This is not how classical musicians use these terms, by the way. I'm just kind of using this for electronic music purposes. And then in between, there's these things called the weak 16th notes. And so most of the time, your pulse and your groove is going to accent this note and maybe also 
this notes. They're kind of the yin and the yang. They alternate and push and pull between each other. And then these notes are usually not accented. They're usually not really played very loudly, if at all. And then you can choose if you add one of those in or you accent one of those notes, you choose to kind of create something called syncopation within your loop, which makes it a little bit more groovy. Syncopation is awesome. You should absolutely have some syncopation in your loop and you have to figure out how much is appropriate for your loop. But so a very standard thing to do in techno and house, for example, is to make a pattern where the velocity emphasizes the upbeat because it feels like a kind of a shaker and it's a very coherent groove that doesn't distract you at all because you can have other musical elements play with it and it just sounds great. Like here's a random synthesizer and the hi-hat is not distracting you from it, it's completing the groove, right? Now it's worth paying attention to how much swing you put in because a very swung groove is very different from a straight groove. It's very different. It has a very different rhythmical pocket and it feels like you dance to it slightly differently. And so don't be afraid of adding this in, but if you do, think that maybe it needs to be reflected in all the elements of your track, not just in one element. Is the global rhythm of your track very swung or not? I don't know, you figure that out for yourself. Now, once we find a rhythmic cell like this that works for us, let's, for example, mute one like this. Let's say this is our rhythmic cell, okay? Now what we can do is we can duplicate a couple of times and we can add in a few little decorative things that don't distract from our rhythmic, rhythmic cell. Yeah, especially some of these syncopated notes as accents. If you look at classic drum machines like the TR-808 and the TR-909, they have this thing in them called accents, where you just have a certain note or a certain beat in your loop jump out a little bit above the rest. And often it's cool to do that, especially on one of the weak 16th notes, if you can pull it off in a way that doesn't interrupt the rhythmic cell. So it's this one, right? Here we go. Now, when adding these exceptions to the rule, you are making your stuff busier, so be careful. My good friend, Oli from Frankfurt, he used to always say, less ambition, less drama in your hi-hats, Oscar. Just keep them stable, keep them simple. So listen to Oli. When in doubt, do less. Let's go into chapter two and talk about the sound design and really focus on the sound design of one hi-hat. Hi-hats are acoustically very similar to white noise. Whether they're sampled from a real instrument or whether they come from a drum machine or they're created by a synthesizer, often what we see is something close to white noise plus a number of sharp resonances in a non-harmonic way. So usually in a way that doesn't refer to a particular pitch on the keyboard, hi-hats tend to be pure percussion and noise. They usually don't ring out at a certain frequency. So which sounds should you use as the basis for your hi-hats? Well, here's a recommendation. Make yourself a super sampler. Make yourself a sampler where you can drop in almost all the hi-hat sounds that you have and then use a selector so you can browse really quickly between them. For example, in Ableton's sampler device, what you can do is you can drag in all your hi-hat samples here and then use this selector at the top to cycle through them. So, for example, I can hit play and look for a timbre that suits me. Hmm. I'm liking this. It's kind of got this airy dustiness to it and it feels kind of soft and that's quite nice. So yes, put yourself in a situation where you can really taste the sounds and then just use your gut to go with the right one. You don't want to intellectualize it. Sometimes machine drum sounds are the best, sometimes synthetic sounds, sometimes acoustic sounds sound better. Just flick through them all really fluidly and then just let your gut decide. Don't overly use your brain for this. Use your feeling and your instinct for this. Now for further sound designing this hi-hat, there are particularly three tools that I really want to draw your attention to. The first one is the ADSR envelope. The second one is the EQ. And the third one is the transient shaper. These each serve a very specific function. Let's talk about the ADSR envelope first. That's the attack, decay, sustain, and release envelope. And it's going to tell us how long does this sound ring out for. Because sometimes you just want your hi-hat to be tap, 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 tap. Tap, 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 tap. Sometimes you want your hi-hat to be schlack, schlack. And sometimes you want your hi-hat to be almost like a shaker with no attack. So first of all, let's put a little note length MIDI device before it. So we have really short staccato MIDI notes going in. 
And then we can determine with the release, for example. Hmm. Here, let me solo this. With the release, you can have things with really short attacks or with smooth attacks. Hmm. Very different feel, right? But both valid. Now let's add in a longer attack. Well, this original sample doesn't even have that much attack to it. Ah, but there. This is very different from this. Right? There's that little percussive envelope at the start. Maybe we want that, maybe we don't. That depends on our style and on our track. Now, this is a great moment to create some aliveness by adding in some modulation, some things that make your sound go longer or short. You see this time parameter here? Let's move it around. Oh yeah, that's cool. So we want this to be done automatically. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into modulation, set up an LFO and map that to time. And then we're going to make sure that it doesn't re-trigger every time that the notes re-triggers. And then we're just going to find a value where it's too much. This is really chaotic, right? We don't want chaos. We just want subtle aliveness. So for example, let's set it once per bar. Okay, take a moment to appreciate this. I'm gonna shut up. You see how the sound is evolving and it's sort of breathing and it feels much more alive than something that was programmed statically? Well, let's reduce the amount, of course, because we're exaggerating it here. Maybe set it to half a bar. I'm liking this. Might increase. You have to really search around a little bit for sweet spots here. Yeah, I'm really enjoying the looseness and it's starting to feel organic and it's starting to feel like it's played by a real human. It's got that tightness and looseness at the same time. I'm a big fan. By the way, if you didn't want something that splashed out with this much energy, bring down your sustains down to zero and use the decay instead to go for an even tighter feel. I actually quite like that. To judge the groove, don't be afraid to bring back in your kick and clap. Yeah, that's good. Okay, that's cool. Now the next tool that we were going to look at is EQ. So, so this thing has frequencies, some combination of noisy frequencies and resonant peaks, and that's all fine, but it also has a tonal balance, aka how much of the super fresh sound is in there versus how much of the dusty mid sounds is in there. And we want to be able to control that. And we just do that with an EQ 8 like this, some kind of parametric EQ to bring out that ultra high freshness in the top end. See how fresh this is versus this? It's not always better to do that, but you need to be able to do that. You need to know when your track needs that like freshness in the top end. And another thing that often happens is that there'll be a lot of low frequencies in here. And sometimes that's awesome. I don't advocate for clearing them out always, but you gotta just be aware that sometimes it's better if you just clear out those mids and just allow this thing to sit in the, in the top and leave the low end for the lows. You know what I mean? This kick is intentionally tiny, by the way. I've cleared it out, right? I'll give you a big kick later <laughs> as a reward for watching through this entire TEDx talk. But you're doing well. So using an EQ8 for this is cool. You can also just use the built-in filter that's inside of your sampler. Usually samplers have a built-in filter. But our little hi-hats is feeling in good shape. Specifically, if we refresh our ears with, this was where we come from. Just a slap in the face each time. This is something totally different, much more nuanced and alive already. And we haven't even added any effects or whatever. 
Now the third tool was the transient designer, right? So the transient shaper. That's this little plugin where you can just set for each percussive attack. Do you want to emphasize the attack or not? And now watch what this does when I sweep it one way or the other. These are totally different elements. Just from sweeping that around, it totally changes the feeling, the emphasis, the vibe, the groove of this. So there's no setting on this that objectively makes your hi-hat better or worse. It's just think about what suits your track. Think about what suits the energy of your track. Does it need something urgent and or does it need something that's more like <laughs> Hi-hats can be either or hi-hats can be both. You're the boss, so act like it. Make some decisions, but these are decisions that you have to make. So we've got movement and aliveness, but not too much movement and not too much distraction. This can kind of hold down a layer in the beats quite easily. I would say sometimes these triple notes can be a little distracting. So let's, when in doubt, do less. Right? Now this is one high hat. Now let's move on to section three. Well done on getting this far. I'm very impressed by you. You're doing amazing. Don't give up now, we're almost there. Are you taking notes? If you're taking notes, you get extra points. Nice, so we've seen programming and we've seen sound design. That's by far the hardest. Now we're gonna look at group sound design and having a little bit too much fun. But first, group sound design. Hi-hats usually don't play on their own. They're usually part of a working top end of a track. What's the next step? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. In a high-end group, you usually have some kind of closed hi-hat, some kind of open hi-hat, some kind of ride cymbal, some kind of crash cymbal, some kind of energy reverse at the end. You might have some high percussion, some high snares, some high claps to complete the groove. And then you might have some effects either on individual elements or on the group as a whole. And these elements act like little Lego blocks in that you can play any combination of them at any given moment in your track. And between sections, it's good to switch it out. Take out one and add in another. Replace the open hi-hat with a closed hi-hat. Add a ride on top of that, take it away. Switching up these elements indicates that you've transitioned from one section of your track to the next, and they give you an enormous amount of options to play with. For example, I've thrown together some quick elements that I haven't really sound designed much, but here, Here's a bunch of, you know, high-end elements. And now we add in our sound designed one. Nice. It gives some space to everything. I'm again not liking my open hi-hats. There we go, much better. When you don't like things, they're often just too loud. Okay. A lot of elements going on here. But you can, but they all kind of work together as a group. And when things get a bit too busy, we have to think again, okay, which beats do we want to emphasize? Where does our groove, our global groove, want to take us? Like, where do we want it to sit? Do we want it to sit on the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or on the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or on the one, two, one, two, dun, 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 dun. or even on the week 16s in between. It's up to you, but sometimes when things get too busy and too confused, it's just because you've lost track of where the global groove of your track is going. Hi-hats like this respond very nicely as well to kind of some blurring and delay effects like delay or reverb or chorus. So you might want to be on headphones to hear the difference, but this is without the effects. And this is with the effects. It's just a little softer. It just has a little bit more three-dimensional space about it. And sometimes adding things like ping pong delays or chorus can really give you a little bit of width if that's what you want. Or at the level of the sample, sometimes you can do random panning per note. And so you can have things kind of shift around a little bit in the stereo spectrum, adding even a little bit more ear candy for those people on headphones who are listening. But again, don't crank this to the max because having hi-hats bouncing around your head is going to distract you from the main musical message. And now I've been going at 107 BPM. I mean, obviously you can go, you can go way faster. Here's 150. This is a different one that I made earlier. Here's another one that I made earlier.
This is the one that we just made together. All together, a bit too chaotic. Although it's kind of cool. I don't even mind it. Oh yeah. Hi-hats for days, baby. Add a ride cymbal. Oh yeah. And a heavy kick. Let's go. Here we go. <laughs> and so as they say in science, this is now a solved problem. Hi-hats are now a solved problem. You've solved them. If you took notes on this, you now have also solved this. I don't know what else one would want beyond this. Leave a comment below if there's like some hi-hat technique that I've missed. Because if there is, I'm just not thinking of it right now. <laughs>